Well, good morning, everyone. It's a real joy to be with you and to open God's Word uh, together. So we continue our study of Luke. We are in Luke chapter 9. And uh, before we read our text, I want to give you just a bit of, uh, I guess, context before we read our section. We'll be in Luke 9, verse 37 to 50. But so Luke, as we've seen so far in his chapter uh, 9, he focuses the content of chapter 9 on the identity of Jesus Christ. And last week, Robin very clearly uh, made the, the point to answer the question, who is Jesus? Who are you with, really? And Luke answers that question with, he is Lord. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And what's interesting in Luke chapter 9, once that revelation is done, from that point forward, Jesus begins to teach his disciples about his death and resurrection. Because the Son of Man, the Son of God, he came on earth with a mission. And the mission is to proclaim God's word and to redeem a people for himself by dying for their sins. And to help him proclaim God's word, Jesus gathered the team. He gathered disciples. He prayerfully considered that and, uh, and called disciples to follow him. And uh, we saw that earlier in the book of Luke. And who are the disciples? The disciples are students. They are followers of their masters. And Jesus' disciples, they are to follow what Jesus does. They are to learn what he does so they can actually do it themselves. So that's the plan for Jesus' team. He's training them to do what he does. So when he is physically not with them, those guys can continue with the mission to proclaim God's word and to advance God's kingdom on earth. Because God's aim is for to establish his kingdom on earth. It is for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's God's plan. He wants the people of the heaven, to the people of his kingdom, to be made up of all the people on earth. All the nations, all the peoples, all the tongues to constitute the people of his kingdom. So that good news about God's kingdom has to spread all across the globe. And also a turning point in chapter 9, it's not only that the revelation of who Jesus is and his death and resurrection, but it is also that Jesus starts to send his disciples out on mission trips. And this is uh, very good. Those guys now are going on practicums. They're students learning to do what the Jesus was doing so they can themselves can do it. So now they're out. They're going to be doing it, and Jesus is doing really well as a great master. He's sending them out on the, pra on the practice while he's still with them to continue their training. And what is interesting about Luke's approach, Luke kind of bookends chapter 9 with two mission trips, one at the beginning of Luke chapter 9, which we saw with Dr. Red, Luke 9, verse 1 through 6. In that mission trip, he sent out the 12, the, his main core team. He sent them out on a mission. And the second mission trip is on, the, on chapter 10, verse uh, 1. You could see where Jesus sends out about 72 others. He sent them two by twos to every town and every place that he himself was going to go. So he's sending, he's sending people out to spread the news about the kingdom. So our text, Luke 9, verse 37 to 50, in this portion of Scripture, Luke reports four instances where Jesus' disciples fail in their work to advance God's kingdom. They fail to heal a boy. They fail to understand the message of the cross. They fail to maintain a spirit of unity among them. And they fail to encourage the expansion of God's kingdom. So we will consider together all those failures in order for us to learn from them and to mature. 
Because part of wisdom is learning not only from your own failures, but also from the failures of others. And I want to share with you this morning three exhortations that I've learned, that I've gathered from studying these failures. I want to share these exhortations with you. And here they are, and we'll get through them through the rest of our time together. The first one is do God's work in complete dependence on God's power. Do God's work in complete dependence on God's power. And the second, pray for the understanding of the message of the cross. Pray for the understanding of the message of the cross. And three, work in unity to advance God's kingdom. Work in unity to advance God's kingdom. So let's pray before we get to these exhortations together. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning. First, we want to say thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to freely gather together to praise you, to sing praises to your name, and to fellowship with one another, and uh, to hear your word being proclaimed. So thank you for this opportunity. Please now, would you please nourish us with your word. Feed us with your word. Open our ears and let your words sink in to our souls to find fertile ground in our hearts and minds. We pray this. We pray that the Spirit, your Spirit, would transform us and conform us to the image of your Son. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, let's read together Luke 9, 37. Well, we'll start, we'll do 37 to 43 first. We'll, we'll read it in sections, so we'll read it in three sections. So the first one, Luke 9, verse 37 to 43. So let me read for you, follow along. On the next day, so that's the day after the transfiguration, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to heal, to uh, cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and to bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to the, his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. So the first exhortation is do God's work in complete dependence on God's power. I mentioned earlier that chapter 9 begins with a mission trip. The, the, Jesus sends his disciples out on a mission trip. Let's take a look at that, if, if your Bible, verse 1 and 2. When he sent them out, he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So notice here that in Jesus sending out his disciples to proclaim the kingdom of God, it, he also gave them authority and power over demons. What? Why would he do that? Well, advancing God's kingdom requires displacing the kingdom of Satan. God's kingdom on earth is overturning the effects of the fall. As we proclaim God's kingdom, 
we are declaring Jesus' victory over Satan, sin, and death. That's spiritual warfare. And human strength cannot do this. God's power is needed to do God's work of establishing his kingdom on earth. So when the disciples proclaim God's kingdom, by God's power, God delivers his people from the kingdom of darkness and transfers them to the kingdom of his beloved son. As we proclaim, that's what God is doing. Kingdom proclamation is spiritual warfare. Jesus gives his disciples power and authority as he sends them out to proclaim God's kingdom. Now, it's important that we mention a couple of things. One, what's happening with the 12 disciples in some ways is unique to them and to their calling. They are the 12, minus Judas, of course, who will become the 12 apostles who form the foundation of the church. So their, in, in, in their redemptive historical context and their specific calling are different than ours. However, they are disciples of Jesus Christ like any other disciples. So you could probably ask yourself, okay, since I'm a disciple, they're disciples, they have power to cast out demons and to heal? Do I have powers to cast out, cast out demons and to heal? Well, there are different ways you can answer that, but here's what I'll say. God still heals people from demonic possessions. God still heals people from all kinds of sickness and diseases. Now, how he does it, through whom he does it, when he does and for whom he does is completely God's prerogative for his own glory. The second thing is that during Jesus' ministry time on earth, the demonic world in his region was very agitated. The king is here. The creator is here. The supernatural is breaking into the natural so for Satan and his minion, that's bad news. So no wonder you see a lot of demonic possession and exorcism in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. So the 12 disciples, needs, they need God's power to do God's work of proclamation of the kingdom. And that's the very work that Jesus Christ himself says he's anointed to do. So you see, as the master, he is doing the work. He's initiating the work. He's training the disciples to do what he does. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus says, this is what I've come to do in Luke chapter 4. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor, to send the to proclaim liberty to those, to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's Jesus' mission. And as he is training disciples, in chapter 9, Luke tells us in the beginning, he gives them power and authority to go do what he does. And what is amazing at the beginning of Luke's gospel is that those disciples, those 12 guys, they did exactly as authorized and empowered to do. In verse 6, you could see, they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. It worked. They used the power and the authority. But what happened here in the text we just read? A father brought a demon-possessed boy to them, to the disciples, and they could not cast it out. They could not. So in one chapter, in a very short period of time, the disciples went from 
demon slayers to demon ignored. What happened? Was, was, was their power kind of temporary? Was it conditional? Was it limited to certain contexts and certain types of demons? How did the disciples go from the high of this ministry success to this ministry failure? Well, I think Jesus' rebuke to them gives us the answer. Jesus tells them, oh, faithless and twisted generation. Faithless and twisted generation. That's rough. That rebuke echoes Old Testament language. In Numbers, the Lord called Israel wicked generation. Why? Because of their lack of faith to go and conquer the promised land that the, after the spies came back to report to them. That's Numbers, Numbers chapter 14. Moses, because of the people's faithlessness, Moses called the people crooked and twisted generation. He says they are perverse generation. Why? Because the people fail to believe that God can do what he says he will do. They were faithless. What's interesting about this account we just read is that Matthew and Mark actually report the same ministry failure. And they report the similar rebuke from Jesus. The people were faithless. The disciples were faithless. Mark's account is much more details than Luke. And for Mark, Mark tells us that the disciples went back to Jesus and to ask him why we could not cast out the demon. And Jesus' answer to them was not only that they were faithless, but they also didn't pray. Their lack of prayer. And prayer is actually an act of faith. Prayer is a demonstration that we depend on God for power and provision. So, basically, the disciples, they did not depend on God for anything. For, so, they were, maybe, maybe after their ministry success, they think, you know, I've got this. I've got this. I don't need prayer. I've got this. So, here they are, the disciples. They're facing the ministry, and they have failed. And Jesus says, you are faithless. Not your activities. You are doing the doing. You're doing the work. But you didn't have faith. You didn't pray. Self has gotten in the way. They have become self-reliant. They have deviated from the straight path. They are twisted. They are crooked. You know, what's deceiving about this crookedness is that it is subtle. The disciples were busy doing the work, but they're doing it without God's power. When self gets in the way, we are no longer, we no longer depend on God to do God's work. Therefore, we don't represent God. We're busy, but we don't represent him. We're no longer expanding God's kingdom, but we're busy doing church work. We are advancing our own selfish agendas whenever we fall into self-reliance. And I think here there's a warning. There's a warning to us. Faithlessness reveals self-reliance. Faithlessness reveals self-reliance. So beware of self-reliance. It's a byproduct of pride. And self-reliance can be really subtle in the life of a Christian, and particularly those of us in ministry, because it could express itself, the way I understand it, it could express itself at two different extremes. It could be an overconfidence in your own works, that's one extreme, 
That's the case of the disciples there. Or it's a low confidence in Jesus' works. These are two extremes of self-reliance. Over overconfidence in your own works or low confidence in Jesus' works. And let me illustrate a little bit. The moment that we begin to believe that our Christian maturity depends on our self-discipline, well, you begin to step into an overconfidence in your own works. And the moment you begin to, to, to believe that the success of your ministry depends on your competence, ah, you dangerously in overconfidence of your own works. And I'm not dismissing self-discipline or competence here, but what I'm saying is this. When competence actually precedes as precedence over dependence on God, you are clearly, clearly, you have gotten it twisted. You're crooked. You've gotten it wrong. And the extreme is there, the other extreme. Every time we doubt of the effectiveness of the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary, where Jesus died for our sins, every time we doubt that, is it going to work really? Is it working this time? Well, we are deadly. We are on a deadly ground of low confidence in Jesus' works. And that's also self-reliant. Every time we doubt of God's love for us because of our repeated failures, every time you doubt that, okay, will he really love me? I've failed so many times. There's no way he's going to love me. Despite he himself says he is he, he's abundantly open, he op welcomes you. If you doubt that, you are there again. You fall into self-reliance. It's a slow confidence on Jesus' works. Now, even though this rebuke from Jesus is to his disciples at the time, and for this particular failure, if, you, if we're honest with ourselves, there are times when we deserve that rebuke. Every time we doubt that God is able to provide for our needs, we deserve the rebuke, faithless, faithless and twisted generation. Every time we doubt that God can do what he said he will do, we, we deserve that rebuke. We do, we deserve it. The faithless and twisted generation. And every time you fall in any form of self-reliance, we, we deserve that rebuke. Faithless and twisted generation. And that's rough. <laughs> Yeah, but there's good news. We'll get to that later. <laughs> in, uh, in this miracle, Jesus, uh, Luke also draws a parallel between G the disciples' power, delegated power and authority and Jesus' intrinsic power and authority. Jesus' power is not limited. It's not Temporary, it's not conditional, it's absolute. Jesus has unlimited power. He, he has ultimate authority to heal and to deliver human beings from all forms of oppression, all forms of situation. Why? Because he is the Son of God. He is the same as God the Father in substance and equal with him in power and glory or majesty. So the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. 
and he is before all things, and in him all things will hold together. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So when Jesus healed that boy, Jesus exercised his power and authority over any and every evil spirit. All, all, all who were present at the time, they marvel at what the Bible says, at the majesty of God. Because Jesus displayed, he revealed the majesty of God. God is among them. God is with them. And the proper response from them, the disciples and anybody else who were there, would be belief. Belief. The crowd of the disciples must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The disciples must listen to him and follow him in complete dependence on the power that only comes through him. Let's keep reading. Verse 43 to 45. And... uh, there's another failure that's going to come. And the exhortation I suggest to you is let's pray for, under, for the understanding of the message of the cross. Luke 9, 43 and 45. Let's just look 43 to 45, Luke 9. But while they were marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand the saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about the saying. Now, right after this awesome display of the majesty of God, Jesus tells his disciples that he's about to die. And this is the second time he tells them this. He's about to die, and this time he puts an emphasis on it. He said, let these words sink into your ears. So he's almost saying, open your head, open your mind. You need to get this. It's amazing that as they are marveling at God and just says, guys, I'm about to die. and I'm about to die. You need to get this. You need to get that. But the disciples, they, 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 the text tells you they, they, don't, they don't understand. They, they didn't get it. And you can imagine, maybe for the disciples, it's something really difficult for them to grasp. First, they just experience the, the three, James, John, uh, uh, and Peter, they were, they were with him in the bond of transfiguration. They heard the voice of God saying that he is the son of God. Be, earlier in the chapter, they say Jesus is the Christ, he's the Messiah. Now, you're going to die? It's, it's kind of off. How can the Messiah die? How can the king, how, how can this majesty, that power, how can he die? So they didn't understand what's going on. But what is interesting, Luke tells us that not only they didn't understand, but they were afraid to ask him for an explanation. Why would the disciples be afraid to ask their master for a clarifying question? And not even Peter dared to ask the question. What's going on here? Now, fear is usually an indicator. We experience fear whenever we feel threatened or whenever something we hold dearly is in jeopardy. So what's going on? Luke doesn't explain why they were afraid. But let's think about it for a moment. Why would you be afraid to ask your teacher for a clarifying question in a classroom setting? Now, for most of us, man, for me... It would be, I don't want to be, I don't want to make a fool of myself. That would be one of them. I mean, let's face it, the disciples, they're not looking so good right now. 
Jesus recently rebuked them with some really harsh words. Oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to bear with you and to be with you? That's not a compliment. That to leave a little dent on their ego. Now, there is more going on here, Luke tells us. There's more going on here. It's not just the egocentric attitude of the disciples. Luke makes us a comment that is particular to his gospel. He says that understanding was hidden from them. So at the moment, God does not grant the disciples the understanding of Jesus' message of the cross. So when Jesus announces his death a third time, Luke records that in chapter 18, and Luke makes this comment. It says, the disciples understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. So this commentary is really consistent with Luke's message that God's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And God, it needs God's power to advance it, and it is God's power that reveals it to his people. It's a spiritual kingdom that requires God's power to advance it and also God's power to actually see it, to reveal it, to understand it. So any understanding of the good news of God's kingdom through the cross requires God's revelation. It's not our brilliance or our wisdom that allows us to actually understand the message of the cross. In fact, the Bible tells us that the message of the cross is folly. The word used for folly that's translated folly could also mean foolishness or absurdity to those who are perishing. But it is power of God for those who are called. You see, in the book of Acts, after the disciples have received power from the Holy Spirit, Peter preached the message of the cross to a crowd, and over 3,000 souls believe in the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. So the message of the cross that was hidden from Peter and the disciples before Jesus' death is now made plain to them by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it requires God's power to open our eyes to understand the message of the gospel, the message of the cross when we're proclaiming God's kingdom. And that, brothers and sisters, that should have bearing in our missional and discipleship work. The understanding of the message of the cross comes from God. So that's why we need to pray. Our role as disciples is to share that message, but we need to pray that the Lord will give our audience understanding of the message of the cross. Because that message is only understood by the power of God. Pray for for the understanding of the message of the cross. Now let's read the last portion, 46 to 50. An argument arose among them, that's among the disciples, as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. So in this section, what I suggest as an exhortation for us is to work in unity to advance God's kingdom. Now the disciples now are arguing among themselves about who's the greatest among them. There's no details about what they were saying or what standards they were using to actually compare themselves to each other. I'm one can only imagine. John said, hey, 
I cast out more demons than you all. I'm the greatest. And James shows up, no, 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 sir. I am the greatest. I healed more people in the last mission trip. And of course, Peter steps in. Quiet, everyone. I'm the goat. <laughs> I confess Jesus is the Christ. Drop the mic and just walk out. <laughs> now, we, we, we don't know what they were talking about. But they were arguing, comparing themselves over who is the greatest. And the point is that it's completely inappropriate for the disciples of Jesus Christ to be measuring themselves to each other to see who's the greatest. The context of this argument and Jesus' response to it shows how inappropriate that is. First of all, when Jesus gathered at the beginning of the chapter, when Jesus gathered the 12 to give them power and authority, there is no indication there was partiality that somehow some got more power than the other. They all 12 were gathered. He gave them power and authority to go. The same power, the same authority to go. So comparing each other who's the greatest, okay, what's the standard there? Second, those guys together just experienced a public ministry failure. None of them, not even one of them, was able to cast out the demon on the boy. Now, maybe you can give P Peter, James, and John a pass because they were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. But there are nine others standing there. Nobody could do anything. Now they are arguing over who's the greatest. Okay, what, what, what's going on here? What, what's the standard, guys? And Jesus just finished telling them for the second time that he's about to die, not of natural death, mind you. He's about to be delivered into the hands of his enemies. Their response to all that, completely dismissal. They are jacking for position. Completely, completely inappropriate that they are measuring themselves who's the greatest among them. This argument shows that the disciples don't fully grasp the nature of their calling. The calling for discipleship is a rejection of self for the reception and the promotion of God's kingdom. Yet, the disciples are pursuing selfish interests above, over and above the interests of the kingdom. They are not caring for one another. Each is seeking its own self-interest and neglecting the interests of others. They are absorbed in self-ambitions. And brothers and sisters, pursuing selfish ambitions in the church distract us from our mission, which is to proclaim God's kingdom on earth. It distracts us. James tells us in James chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, we read, But if you have bitter jealousy, and James is addressing the church, if you have bitter jealousy, in selfish ambition in your hearts. Do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. It is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Uh-oh. Notice what James says in verse 15 in addressing the church. The pursuit of selfish ambitions within the church, within the community of believers, is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. So the disciples, in arguing among themselves over who's the greatest, is a sign that they are more concerned over earthly matters, not heavenly matters. They are operating in the flesh, not by the Spirit, and they are under demonic influence, not godly wisdom. Now, this may come as a surprise, a shock to some of you. How can the disciples of Jesus are under demonic influence? Well, I mentioned earlier, the proclamation of God's kingdom is spiritual warfare. The Christian life is spiritual warfare. If you are with Jesus, you are against Satan. So, as followers of Christ, don't be surprised when the enemy attacks you. This is 
war. Peter tells us in his first letter. Here's what Peter says. He says, be sober-minded. Be watchful. What? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion seeking someone to devour. We are called to do what? To resist him. Huh? Firm in our faith in our trust in God, on his power to sustain us, to keep us. And the Apostle Paul, he warns us. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this, over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The Bible warns us. Most of us expect that demonic attacks would be like this boy being shaken, being tossed out. But more often than not, I dare to say, demonic attacks are actually more subtle than that. The enemy is crafty. He entices us to do what we are already inclined to do. He tempts us. He develops schemes that would draw us without even realizing it immediately. Let me illustrate this a little bit. After Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, and Jesus tells them that I'm about to die, in the Gospel of Mark and Matthew, Peter rebuked Jesus. He says, your death cannot happen. What was Jesus' response to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's Peter. He caught Satan, not Peter. In our text, Jesus tells his disciples for the second time that I will die. He says, let this sink into your ears. I'm about to die. Next thing you know, those guys are involved in rivalry and they are stopping others from casting out demons. In both cases, these guys have moved from professing Christ in one minute and opposing him the next. How did that happen? How did they become really effectively agents of the enemy without even realizing it? You know, there is no neutral ground in this war. We are either with Christ or against him. We are either advancing God's kingdom or we are hindering it. The disciples were hindering the advance of God's kingdom by trying to stop somebody else who was doing the work. The work they just failed to do. And John, in this text, seemed to be very confident in trying to stop this guy. He says, he's not with us. He's not with us. That was his reason. He's not with us. What? He shouldn't be doing what he's doing because he's not with us. Now they become cliquish. Cliquish. But they fail to understand that Jesus' plan goes beyond John. <laughs> Jesus' discipleship plan is beyond John. It's beyond the 12 disciples. It is beyond the, the ethnic boundaries of the Jewish people. It is the earth. It is all the nations. It is all the peoples way beyond John. John is limited in his vision, in his capacity to see, to see this at this moment. Jesus rebukes him. Don't stop him. Don't stop him. He's not against you. He's with you. He's for you. We're on the same team. These, these guys are, have completely, completely missed this. The scene, the scene of what God, what Jesus is doing among them. So I wonder, what is your attitude when you see others from other ministries. When you see other ministries operating 
When you see people in other church, people who are not part of your clan, people who are not part of your tribe, people who are not, uh, 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 they're not reformed, they're not, uh, they're not Pentecostal enough for you. What, what, what's your attitude? What's your first, first, first disposition toward them? Is it encouragement or is it criticism? Do you want to stop them or do you want to encourage them? You see, our roles as, as disciples, we are really to be true ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Because ambassadors, what drive ambassadors is the interest of the kingdom that sends them. They pursue the interest of the kingdom over and above their own interests. So anything, anybody that's furthering the interest of the kingdom, they support it. That's the role of the ambassador representing a kingdom. So as disciples, as we represent Christ, as we proclaim the kingdom, when we see people effectively, faithfully proclaiming and advancing God's kingdom, we don't blame or try to put them down. We pray for them, we encourage them, and support them however we can. Because it is for God's kingdom. We need to recognize our co-laborers who are working on the field with us. Now, as, as I talk about this, uh, this, uh, this spiritual warfare and this kingdom work, we're not without weapons to, over, to do our work. We're not without weapons to proclaim God's kingdom. We're not without weapons to engage in this war. And Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 10, 6, verse 10 and 12, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, be strength, huh? In the Lord. <laughs> be, str be, strong, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And what? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And Paul, in describing the old armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, and he describes all the different facets, but one part of the armor that is interesting in verse 16, he says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So how did the disciple fail so badly? Jesus tells us they were faithless. They have dropped their shield of faith. By dropping their shield of faith, now they become exposed to all the flaming darts of the enemy. They are living and thinking in the flesh, completely blind of what God is doing among them. And they were not supporting others who were pro pro uh, pro promoting God's kingdom. Unity among the disciples is important to Jesus. Now he, does, he, he does not let this argument among those guys linger among the disciples. He didn't let it stay too long. He nips it in the bud, knowing the flawed reasoning of their hearts. Jesus cuts to their sinful mess with a lesson. He turns their whole world upside down. He takes a child and he puts him by his side to demonstrate the lesson. He tells his disciples that in the kingdom where they are called to live and which they are, they are called to, pro, to promote, in that kingdom, if they want to be the greatest, they need to be the least. And he uses a child to demonstrate that. It is an upside down kingdom. Men's social structure and men's standards are not applicable in God's kingdom. So in Jesus' lesson, a child has nothing to offer except uh, cuteness. They're cute. They have nothing else to offer. They are completely dependent on an adult for their survival. And they are also in a household toward the bottom of the structure. So this example is a good example for those guys who want to be, I want to be the greatest. He says, well, you want to be the greatest? Be like a child. That's just turn the whole concept upside down. 
upside down. And whoever receives this child in my name, Jesus says, you receive me when you do that. You receive me. And by receiving the son, the text says, you receive also the father who sent Jesus, who sent the son. So Jesus is telling us that by being hospitable to each other, especially the needy among us, the lowly among us, we demonstrate that what it looks like to be God's people living in God's kingdom with God's power. You don't have to show off and beat your stomach to show that you are God's people. A clear, humble stance of being hospitable, <laughs> hospitable to the least of us, actually demonstrates that you are part of this kingdom. And it's a kind of counter to our culture. Counter to our culture because we, we want to build our network with people who are well-connected. <laughs> That's how we build our network. People who are well-connected, who are well-respected. Because it kind of makes us somehow we feel connected and respected too. The teenagers, you want to hang with, uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the cool kids. Those who are, will enhance your likes on social media. You don't want to hang with uh, someone who's awkward. We tend to neglect the ones who have nothing to offer us in return. We pursue our self-interest. We, we, we seek what's in it for us in almost every relationship we engage in. And Jesus is just turning this, this the kingdom of God is completely the upside down of this. You need to receive the Lord. So the life among us Christian believers, not to be like marked by infighting like these disciples. He has to be marked by, by mutual care, mutual care, looking out for each other's interests. And that's what the New Testament writers keep saying over and over. And Paul, for example, in Philippians, he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. In humility, count others more significant than yourself. And let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. See, those exhortations are based on Jesus' own life. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. Jesus cared for the needy, the disenfranchised, the disvalued. Jesus was humble. Jesus, Jesus did not prom promote his own self, his own self-interest. He did the work of the kingdom. And the Apostle Paul also reminds us in Philippians that though Jesus, who had all the reasons to actually show off and show his strength in every area, he didn't do that. He did not, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. And being born in the likeness of men and being the, and found in a human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So that's Jesus' life. That's the model. That's the standard. So as, we, as, as, as you think through your life as a disciple and you see the people around you, who do you associate yourself with the easiest? Those who look like you? Those who will give you something in return? Those who keep you connected? The teenagers, who do you hang with at school? Do you, do you, do you show any interest to those who are awkward, those who are secluded? If you are a disciple of Christ, Christ is asking us to have a heart toward the needy, to have the heart toward those who are low. So, I mean, the disciples are examples of just of failures. You see these different failures that they've, they, 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 they've, they've uh, uh, gone through. They fail to depend on God for his power, for his power to do his work. And just make it very clear, they are faithless. And their faithlessness exposed them to the attacks of the enemy. 
Their faithlessness revealed their self-reliance. Self got in the way of God's kingdom's interest. It caused them to be afraid to ask Jesus for a clarifying question. Maybe that could be one of the reasons. He led them to rivalry, their faithlessness, their self, and it became a barrier to, uh, to the expansion of God's kingdom because they started to stop others from doing God's work. So, brothers and sisters, so these, these men were walking with God. They, they were with Christ. They saw him, yet they failed miserably. They failed miserably. But what is interesting through their failures is that Jesus didn't reject them. It is amazing as Jesus saw the boy and had compassion on the boy and the father and looked at his disciples who just miserably failed him. As he's telling them, look, I'm about to die. Those guys, they had, they had, they had no clue. <laughs> They had even no, no expression of concern. They decided to just jack him for position instead, dismissing what Jesus said. Jesus, all ministry is the proclamation of God's kingdom. These guys are stopping somebody else doing the work. Jesus had all the reasons to fire them. He didn't do that. He approached them. He taught them. He fed them with his word. He used all these failures as a moment of shaping and training and conforming to his image. Because God's heart is that his disciples will have the same heart that he has. The compassion that he displayed, he wants his disciples to have that same compassion. Not in fighting, no. Care for one another. Show the unity that it is among you. Even if somebody is not like you or with you or in your clique, but if he's doing the work of my work, he's doing my work, you support him, you pray for him. But you see, it, he's training them. So today you, you may feel like, I, I don't deserve to come to Christ because I've failed so badly. My life's a mess. I've rejected Christ before. The invitation is to come. Come to Jesus because he drew near the failures of his disciples in order to shape them, in order to train them. Would you come? Come to him. And you may be a believer and you know your life is just, I keep, I keep falling for the same stuff over and over again. Don't you believe the lie that God will reject you? Come to him. Come to him. So he can feed you with his word and conform you to the image of the son. And let these words sink into your ears, this invitation. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So regardless of a failure this morning, would you please come to the Lord and find rest. God bless you.